Okay, for our last uh, section of this chapter here, chapter four, we're going to be looking at uh, using trigonometry to solve real problems. A okay. um, couple of uh, vocabulary words that I want to review here. Uh, the angle of elevation and angle of depression. There's a lot of trigonometry problems that involve angles, okay, either up into the sky, if you will, or down from the sky to the ground. Okay. We want to make sure we're clear on this, that the angle of elevation okay, is if we were... Uh, a person here looking up at something, okay, the angle of elevation is going to be the angle that involves the line of sight, okay, and also the horizontal, because okay, we're ultimately going to make a right triangle out of the situation if we're going to be asked, you know, how tall is this item that we're dealing with. Okay, the line of sight and the horizontal, okay, that's going to be below, is going to be what I call our angle of elevation. Okay? So the angle through which the eyes move up from the horizontal looking at something above. So if we were looking straight across, if this was us, we're looking right straight across horizontally. Okay? And then we move our eyes up to the item that we're looking at. So George Washington's eye here. Okay? Then that angle would be the angle that our eyes move from the horizontal up to the line that connects our eyes to George Washington's eye in this case. Fair enough? Okay. Now, <clears throat> the angle of depression okay, is generally going to be going the other way, going to be going down, we're going to be looking across horizontally here, and then if there's something below us, okay, the angle of depression is going to be the angle our eyes move from the horizontal to the line of sight, okay, between me and these two dudes in a boat. Fair enough? Okay. So the angle at which the eyes move from horizontal to look at something below. So that angle right there is always going to be the angle of depression. So as soon as you see a problem that says something about the angle of elevation or angle of depression, okay, the key issue is can you draw that picture? Okay, and your drawing should look like one of these two pictures, no matter what you're looking at. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at uh, this problem. So the uh, angle of elevation from the buoy to the top of the Barnegat Bay Lighthouse is 100, uh, 130 feet above the surface of the water is 5 degrees. And we want to find the distance from the base of the lighthouse to the buoy. Okay. So, again, the angle of elevation is always going to be with the horizontal and going up. So that's why this is the 5 that they mentioned. Okay. The lighthouse height, they told us, is 130 feet. So that's why that is going to be 130, because that's the actual lighthouse here in my picture. Okay. And then ultimately, we want the distance from the base of the lighthouse. So the base of the lighthouse is the bottom. Okay. Out to that buoy would be our X. Okay. So the key issue for us here today is going to be making sure that we can actually produce this picture. Okay. Because after that, then it's you know, just a trick problem at this point, okay, just like we did with number one in our warm-up today. Okay, instead of uh, sine, though, that would be tangent. We have the opposite, and we need the adjacent. So if we set up our tangent sentence, it's a tangent of 5 degrees equals 130 over x. And then from there, we could say x tangent 5 equals 130. And if we divide by tangent 5, let's see what we get. 130... Once again, make sure your calculator is in radian or is in degree mode since they gave you degrees to work with. So 130 tangent 5 gives you 1485.907, and the units here are feet. Okay. And now, uh, one other thing I would always suggest too in a problem like this is make sure that your answer makes common sense. Okay. Looking at the picture here, if we have a five degree angle, is that a very big angle? And if our angle of sight to the top of that lighthouse is only 5 degrees, I'm going to have to be pretty far out into the water here, aren't I? This buoy. Okay. So is it surprising that that's quite a bit bigger than 130, knowing that I have a 5 degree angle here? And think of the other thing in geometry we learned about. If this is 90 and that's 5, okay, then wouldn't this be 85? Okay. And we learned in geometry that angles that are across, or sides that are across from angles, okay, if I have a small angle, the side should be small. If I have a big angle, the angle to the side should be bigger. Okay. It's going to be a lot bigger across from an 85 than the one that's across from the 5. Okay. So once again, when you get done, okay, if your answer doesn't make common sense like that, then there might be a problem. Okay. Go back and try to figure out if you set the problem up wrong or if you made a wrong calculation or if your calculator is not in the right mode. Okay. Those are some pitfalls that people have trouble with generally with these types of problems. Okay. All right. Let's take a look at uh, another one here. Okay, this time we have uh, says from the top of a 100-foot tall air traffic control tower. And before I read anything else, I'm going to stop and start drawing. Okay. So I got a 100-foot 
air traffic control tower. So here's my tower. It's 100 feet. I'm going to go ahead and put that label on there right away. Okay. So it says an airplane is observed flying toward the tower. And it says the angle of elevation of the airplane changes from 32 to 10 during this period of observation. And the altitude of the plane changes from 500 to 200. And we want to know how far does the plane travel. So like I said, the key issue here for us is to be able to take those that English word situation and translate that into a math situation. And so here we are with our tower. And it says, again, the angle of elevation to the plane changes from 32 to 10. All right, I'm going to actually redraw this so I can get a little more space here because the plane is going to be up here somewhere. So keep in mind that if we're going to do an angle of elevation from the top of the tower, I'm going to draw my horizontal there. Okay, the angle of elevation was 32, and then 10. Okay. So that angle right there is my 32. That angle right there is my 10. Okay. And then it says that uh, <coughs> during this observation, okay, the altitude of the plane changed from 500 to 200. And again, ultimately, we want to know how far does that plane travel. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, use their picture because their art's better than mine. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> as we're as the plane is coming in, once again, here's my 32 degrees, here's my 10 degrees. Okay. And I know that the 10 degree angle on that 10 degree triangle, my height, if you will, from the top of the tower to the above part is 200, okay, which makes this 100, keep in mind, because it's 200 above the ground. Okay. In this triangle, okay, we're 500 feet above the ground when we start right here. Okay. That means that from the horizontal from the top to the top of this, that would be 400, of course, because remember this is 100 feet over here too. Okay. So that part of it being 400. Okay. All right. And then ultimately, we want to get the uh, the distance, the change in distance for this airplane, okay, which is going to be from this part right here, okay, from ultimately the x-coordinate at this point and the x-coordinate at this point. So with that said, <coughs> let's go ahead and figure out the x-coordinate of the 110 part. Okay. So if we want to figure out this length right here, we have 100 here, which is the opposite. We have x, which is the adjacent. So that makes it a tangent sentence, just like the previous problem. So notice they did just what we did earlier. We go tangent of 10 equals 100 over x. We solve that, we get 567.1. So remember, that's the x value from here to here. All right. And then ultimately, we're going to need to do a similar sentence with the 32 degree angle. Now we're working with this bigger triangle here. Okay. Our only issue here, though, is that we don't know okay, <clears throat> that d value here, and that's ultimately what we're trying to find is that d value. Okay, but we do know that tangent of 32 is equal to 400. Like I said, we're looking at this triangle right here, so we don't want to use 500 because 100 is below the line, if you will. So we're going to have 400, and then we can figure out the entire length here. That entire length, according to this picture, is x plus d. So that would ultimately equal x plus d. And if we do the math on that, subtract x from the other side, okay, we're going to get a, end up being 73. In this case, uh, I believe it was no, it's, it's feet, I guess. All right. Now, one other thing that I want to also issue here is that, uh, is that you don't really have to necessarily um, work with two variables here if you don't want to. Okay, could I just take the small triangle and figure out the length of the base, if you will? and then take the big triangle, figure out the length of its base, and then just subtract those two x values? Okay. Certainly. Okay. So if you want to set it up like that where there's two variable, variables involved, you can. Otherwise, like I said, if you just take this small triangle right here and figure out what its length is, and then go to the big triangle and figure out what its length is, okay, the difference between those two lengths is just going to be the value of the change, which the change is how far did the plane go. Okay. All right. Questions so far?
right, I want you to find in your book, uh, page 426. Okay. We have another uh, problem posed to us in example three at the bottom of that page. And ultimately, the information given would lead us to this picture. Right. So it says we have a large helium-filled penguin moored at the beginning of a parade route. Waiting to start of the parade, two cables <clears throat> attached to the underside of the penguin are at angles of 40, 8, and 40 with the ground, with the ground and are on the same plane as the perpendicular line from the penguin to the ground. And it says if these cables are attached, they're 10 feet from each other, how high above the ground is the penguin? Okay. So <clears throat> with that said, like I said, the two wires are attached to the penguin, which is uh, right up here. So I'm not going to attempt to draw a penguin here, but ultimately we got two wires. One's at 40 degrees, one's at 48 degrees, and all we know is that those two wires are 10 feet from each other. Okay. And so our issue here is uh, how high in the air is this penguin? Okay. So we have, if you recognize here, two right triangles, okay, but neither one of them can be solved directly because we don't know any, essentially any of the side lengths. So the question is, what are we going to do then in that case? Well, the fact that we have two of them is, uh, is good because we can write two sentences here. Even though they both might have two variables in them, we still have two sentences, which is going to allow us to solve it eventually. So with that said, let's take, talk about the, the biggest triangle here with a 40-degree angle. Still be a tangent sentence because we're dealing with opposite over adjacent. So we could write tangent of 40 in this picture would equal h over 10 plus x. True? So that would be a true sentence in this problem, wouldn't it? Okay. We could also write a sentence that says tangent 48 equals h over x. Okay. Wouldn't that be true as well? Okay. And so with that said, <clears throat> neither one of these equations by itself is solvable. Okay, but if we recognize that there's two equations and they both have the same variables, okay, then we can use substitution to solve. So in order to do that, of course, we want to get one of the variables by itself. So I would suggest uh, solving the bottom one for h. Okay. If I solve the bottom one for h, then I could take this and I could plug it into the top one for h. And then I have a sentence that only has one variable. Okay. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to go tangent 40 equals x tangent 48 over 10 plus x. Okay. And with that said, we're going to solve this. I would multiply it by 10 plus x. Okay. All right. And if you uh, distribute that, we're going to get 10 tangent 40 plus x tangent 40 equals x tangent 48. Now, Keep in mind that this right here is just a number. Okay. Tangent 40 and tangent 48 are just numbers. So really, is this any different than 5 plus 2x equals 3x? Is it any different than that format right there? So even though we don't have ex actual numbers here, okay, we know they're numbers. So solving, we should do the same thing. So when we solve this, we'd have tangent, tangent 40 on this side. And then if we subtract okay, over here, we're going to have x tangent 48 minus x tangent 40, which means we'd subtract the two tangents, tangent 48 minus tangent 40 times x. You notice I haven't done anything with the calculator yet because I don't want to round a bunch of stuff and then use rounded answers to get my final answer. Okay, so I'm just going to leave it in that exact form for the time being. And then, of course, the final step would be to divide by the parentheses here and get our value for x. So when I do so, see what we get. So we got 10 tangent 40. And then we're going to divide that by tangent 48 minus tangent 40. And if we do so, we get 30.905. And that's a measure of feet because it's our x value in our picture. Now the only problem with that though is that they didn't ask for x, they asked for h. But, don't we have a nice relationship right here between x and h? 
So if we take that number that I just got there for x and I multiply it by tangent 48, I get my h value. So my h value then is 34.323 feet. And that tells me how high off the ground that thing went is. I don't know. Uh, one question I have here before we uh, finish with this problem is, could I have, if I wanted to, could I have solved one of these two equations uh, for x? and then plug that in for x, and then I would add in a sentence that had h in it directly. Yeah, and I could have bypassed having to do that last step if I did it that way. It doesn't really matter which variable you solve for. And just like any substitution problem, you can either substitute h or x. It's up to you. Um, but ultimately, if we had gotten rid of x and used h, we could have found h directly and then had to do the last substitution. But in the scheme of things, pretty much the same time, I would suggest.